We have made it to the offseason here in the Golden State Warriors franchise here on NBA 2K25. And today's episode will be headlined by our draft preview. We're going to talk about some of these prospects within the draft and where their draft stock currently lies. With the college basketball season wrapped up, we'll recap what happened. And as you can see here, everybody is all over the place in the mock drafts. It has been a hectic season. With the changes I've made within scaling players' potential, this draft and how these players perform at the next level will be more unpredictable than ever to try to emulate the unpredictability of the NBA draft. Yesterday in the channel survey slash update video, I said that the draft episode would be on Wednesday. I lied. It's going to be on Thursday, and the Broncos draft is going to be on Wednesday. Both of those are going to be pushed back by a day, but they'll still be next to each other, which is pretty fun. What was not fun was us getting swept in the first round by Oklahoma City. Game three, we did not show up. We did not put up a fight. Game four, we kind of just threw stuff at the wall, hoped it would stick, and to be honest, it almost did. Steph Curry had his best game with 38 points, 32 for Butler. Kuminga had 20, but the rest of the role players didn't really step up. We ran a zone defense to try to keep them out of the paint, and it worked. The problem is they got way too many open looks from three, and we got beat by Lou Dort and Isaiah Joe wrapping up our playoffs without a single win. Steph Curry averaged a lot of points, but he only shot 40% from the field. Jimmy Butler's efficiency was inconsistent. Jonathan Kuminga had his ups and downs. And if those three guys are not performing at the highest level, especially against a team like Oklahoma City, who has so many different ways they can beat you, it's going to be hard to get by them. So we're going to simulate through the rest of the playoffs, starting with the first round, and let's address the elephant in the room. The number one seeded Minnesota Timberwolves, who were up 2-1, to one, have lost three in a row. It certainly hurts that Carl Anthony Towns has been out, but even so, the eight seed Clippers, shout out Kawhi Leonard, these guys were out of it for most of the season, but they piled some wins together late. They snuck out of the play-in tournament, and they upset Minnesota. Otherwise, not too many surprises. Wemby upsets Jokic in the first round as Victor Wembanyama wins his first career playoff series. And then in the second round, it's all chalk. No major upsets. Dallas and OKC will face off in the West. Knicks and Heat in the East. The Heat, of course, made the big Jimmy Butler trade. They now have Jalen Suggs along with a lot of our former role players, Wiggins, Looney, Payton. It would kind of be a bad look for us if they made the finals. Luckily, they don't. The Knicks end up winning in five with 39 points in the clincher from Jalen Brunson while Jalen Suggs shoots a toward eight. Dallas, meanwhile, beats OKC in six, and Dallas is back in the finals for a second consecutive season. The Mavericks and the Knicks. This should be a really fun matchup as Dallas wins game one, the Knicks take game two, and game three, and game four. So New York leads three to one. They can win the championship on their home floor, and they dominated early in this game, but the Mavs battled back and were tied with around three and a half minutes to go. We're going to hop in. We're going to see if the Knicks can win this championship their first in over half a century as Precious Achua is in with the slam off the pick and roll with the assist by Brunson. Following Mavericks possession, here's Irving with it. Good ball movement by Dallas. They're going to have to get rid of it pretty quickly. Luka, open three. It's good! And Dallas takes the lead, 104-103. Brunson back with it. Going right back to the pick and roll. Precious Achua again, wide open. I don't know why Derek Lively's not in the game. He's the guy you would trust to defend the rim. He's healthy. He only has three fouls. Daniel Gafford is getting exposed as Brunson hits the open three. They double Randall. I don't know why they left Brunson open because Randall's a good passer. And, well, it's Jalen Brunson. Luka gets two back with the short shot over Jalen Brunson. And the Knicks are going to call time. 108-106. Off the timeout, Brunson with the inbound, drives left side, layup is good. It's the Brunson Bowl, he's facing off against his former team. Another fun storyline, Clay Thompson looking for ring number five away from Golden State. He gets it to the big man, Lively for three, and it's good! Derek Lively, not known for the jump shot, hits a huge three for Dallas, we're within one. Around a minute later, there has not been much offense. Mitchell Robinson with the offensive rebound, and Anunobi is fouled on the three. Clay Thompson, now is not the time to hold up your fours. Number one rule of defense, don't foul the jump shooter. Now the Mavericks would end up dodging a bullet. OG would make just one of three at the line, 
And so it remains a two-point game with around 40 seconds to go. Dallas has to score here. Luka in isolation. Step back for the tie. He got it! 111-111. Luka Magic strikes again. 30 seconds to go now. Dallas looking for the stop. Knicks looking for the lead. Brunson, three. That one is off the mark. Irving with the rebound. And the Mavericks with a chance to take the lead here in the corner. Luka is intercepted by Brunson. Knicks have a timeout, won't use it. 10 seconds to go. Brunson for the lead. Off the mark. Rebound by Lively. And Dallas calls time with 8.3 seconds to go. Can the Mavericks win game five? With the shot clock unplugged, it's Luka Doncic with it. Doncic on the drive. That one is no good. Mitchell Robinson with the stop. Randall with the rebound. And the Knicks call time. They'll get it with 1.7 seconds left and an opportunity to win the finals. Dallas needs their best defensive possession of the season because their season is on the line. At the Knicks score here, they will win the championship. I imagine Brunson's the go-to guy, but really it's a matter of whoever gets an open look. But I imagine they'll also prioritize getting this closer to the basket. On the inbound, it's Robinson. Nobody's open. It goes to Brunson. Pulls from 40 for the championship. It's good! Jalen Brunson wins it for the Knicks! I don't believe it! Pandemonium in the Mecca! Jalen Brunson with basically a logo three calls game for the championship! And the New York Knicks win the 2025 NBA Finals in unbelievable fashion. Jalen Brunson was at least 10 feet beyond the three-point line. That play could not have been executed any worse for the Knicks, but he drills the three for the win when normally a team wins a championship and we get the reaction from the bench. It's not that authentic because it's not really a surprise. Well, here it is. Did anybody in this arena expect him to make that shot for game? So the Knicks end up winning the title. The Nova Knicks win again after two national championships at the University of Villanova. This time they didn't have to beat Kansas to win the title. So I'll enjoy this championship for them a little bit more. Of course, they never made the trade with Carl Anthony Towns, who lost in the first round in part due to his injury. So Dante DiVincenzo and Julius Randle still here. They are champions along with Brunson. Bridges, Anunobi, Hart, and the rest of the gang. So let's look at this play again. I think Dallas's inbound defense is pretty good. Their defenders are not moving, but they're still stationary and close by to the offensive players. This play is clearly ran for Brunson, and Dallas recognizes why bother getting close to him 35 feet away from the hoop. If we get too close, we could be in danger of fouling him, which would be the worst possible defensive possession. Now, the problem for Dallas is, I guess they did not know that Jalen Brunson had curry range for the championship. And so the New York Knicks won their first title in over 50 years. How is Luka winning the finals MVP? His team lost. Who should we give it to? Hmm. Probably the guy who averaged 32 and hit the 35-foot game winner. Shout out Mitchell Robinson. He had three assists, one of which was the dagger. He also shot 90% from the field. So the Knicks end up winning the title, and it's a little bit ironic because last year in the Blazers series, the Knicks also won the title in year one, but it was a little bit more of a surprise. They were a six seed. They kind of came out of nowhere. This season, it was a lot more predictable. They had the best record in the NBA. And ultimately, they get it done. And that sets us into the offseason for good. Looking at the list of retirements. Chris Paul, Kyle Lowry, Al Horford, Mike Conley, Brooke Lopez. In the fourth quarter, yelling, why Nick Batum and DeAndre Jordan, Russell Westbrook. Paul and Westbrook will make the Hall of Fame. As for Jersey retirements, Westbrook with OKC, Paul with the Clippers, Lowry with the Raptors. I'm surprised Chris Paul isn't there for the Warriors. What a run. Warriors, Chris Paul. Anyway, rule change time. Normally, I have a few rules that I always like to add during the series. 20-second shot clock, expansion teams, abolishing the one-and-done rule, but I don't like to do those in year one. So instead, we're going to do the clear path rule where a player who is fouled in transition with a clear path to the basket will get two, three throws, and their team keeps possessions. I want cool fast-break dunks, and this is how we're going to get them. Anyway, lottery time. 
Obviously, we're not in the draft lottery since we made the playoffs, but it'll still be interesting to follow. These are the worst teams in the league. Now, granted, a lot of them traded their picks away. It feels like a two-person draft at the top. We kind of have a feeling that Miko Kaponen and Bardo Campolo will go number one and number two in some order. So because of that, if you land in the top two, you're going to be pretty happy. I don't think there's much of a difference between one and two in this year's draft. And then I think there's a gap afterwards. So let's get this show on the road. The 2025 NBA Draft Lottery, the Miko Kaponen and Bardo Campolo sweepstakes, if you will. So let's get started. The 14th pick goes to the San Antonio Spurs. We do not need another demon alongside Victor Wembanyama. Thank God. The 13th pick goes to the Detroit Pistons. I'm a little bit disappointed. I feel like the NBA owes the Pistons for their horrible lottery luck. The Hawks get the 12th pick. They obviously won the lottery last year with picking Zachary Rizache, number one overall. Number 11 goes to the Nets via the Rockets. The Rockets will get the better of their pick and Brooklyn's pick. Number 10 goes to the Pelicans. No movement up to this point as we move to number 9. That goes to the Grizzlies. I feel like we're due to have somebody jump up. Will it be Atlanta? No. They do have picks 8 and 12, though. Not Boston. Oh, my goodness. Boston's moving up into the top fours. The Spurs get 7. The Rockets, via Brooklyn, will get number 6. And then number 5 can be anyone other than Boston. And it's Charlotte who takes a drop. I think they originally had the third best odds, and we are down to 4. Portland, Washington, Utah, and Boston. Number four goes to the Wizards, and this is the big one. In a two-player draft, you want either picks one or two. You don't want three. Portland ends up with the third pick, so Boston and Utah get the top two picks. The Celtics land number two, and that means the Utah Jazz, I believe for the first time in franchise history, have won the number one pick. So Danny Ainge, who's been accumulating all these assets over the last few years, now gets to add a franchise player, and he gets to pick between Kaponen and Kempolo. Boston gets number two, one year removed from winning a title. This year did not go well for them. They were only a game out of the play-in in the Eastern Conference, and it's a blessing in disguise that they miss out. They now have a great asset where they can add a young player or use it in a trade. We do have a few open spots on our staff. We're going to hold on to Steve Curry. He's making a lot of money, and... In the game, at least. He's still a pretty good coach. So we're going to offer Matt Clemens to be our assistant general manager. And then for our head scout, we're going to look at Dell Moore. Steph Curry's name is technically Dell, in a sense. His dad's name is Dell. So there you go. Now it's time for our draft preview with the NBA Combine pre-draft workouts. And of course, the conclusion of the college basketball season. Of course, we don't have a lot of young talent on this team. It's not ideal when our two best players are the second and fourth oldest players in the entire league. Now, Steph and Jimmy still have a lot left in the tank, but they're not going to be around here forever. And outside of Kuminga and Pajemski, there's not a lot of young talent on this team. So our number 22 overall pick could end up being really valuable for us. But if we want to keep the title window open, maybe we float it in a trade. So I pulled 40 of the more relevant players in this draft class, and I was able to compile their stats on the year, whether they played at the collegiate level, internationally, or with some other professional leagues such as OTE. We're going to be referencing these stats throughout the preview and whose stock went up and down. Feel free to pause if you want to take a look, find your player. As for the final four, the Kansas Jayhawks win the title over UConn. So Kansas was not able to do it in our Dynasty series. They barely missed out, but they get the job done on the hardwood. Let's talk about this draft class. And as I've talked about, it's a two-player class at the top. There's no clear number one between Miko Kaponen and Bardo Campolo. Both of them were in the conversation to go number one going into the year, and both of them were unbelievably good this season, cementing their status as top prospects. Both of these guys are worthy of going number one, and I think in a normal season, they would, but they just so happen to be coming out together. And we'll start with Miko Kaponen, who had a terrific season at the University of Arizona. 20.3 points, 6.7 rebounds, 2.8 assists, nearly 50% from the field, and he led Arizona to a spot in the Final Four as a freshman. This is nearly a 7-foot forward who can just about do it all. He's an impressive athlete. He can run the floor. He can play make. He's great at driving to the basket. He's a terrific defender. The one thing he doesn't really have in his arsenal yet is the 3-point shot. Only 28% this year with the Wildcats. 
The rest of this game is complete, and given his size at 6'10", 230, his length, and his athletic profile, the upside is there for him to be a superstar. He just has to develop the outside shot, and he will be a complete player offensively. He's already a pretty complete player defensively. He's a phenomenal rim protector. He's got great lateral quickness. He can hang with guards on the perimeter. This is somebody who is Defensive Player of the Year upside, or at the very least, somebody who can make all defensive teams in the future. And then we get to Bardo Campolo. He played in one of the best leagues in the world and really flourished. 14 points per game, little over four rebounds, 46% from the field. I think his floor is a little bit higher than Capone because I think he's a more traditional wing. I think his ceiling is a little bit lower because I think he's less unique as a prospect. But overall, these two guys actually have a lot of similarities. And I see why teams are going to have a hard time deciphering between the two of them because they're very similar prospects. Campolo is also a really good finisher. He's also not a great three-point shooter. A little bit better than Capone and shot 31% from deep. I think he can protect the rim, but he's more of a traditional wing. Terrific perimeter defender, one of the best in this class. He's got an unbelievable motor. And again, somebody who's going to be one of the best defensive players in the NBA, given his development. These two guys are terrific prospects who, again, have a lot of similarities. And I think it's just going to be a matter of who the Jazz prefer as they go number one. With the third pick, that's where the draft really opens up. The Blazers will be on the clock. And a lot of people seem to think that French wing Martin Sifa is the third best prospect in this draft. It's not consensus, but I would say more people than not agree. And for good reason. Sifa is a terrific prospect. Averaged around 11 points per game, 4 rebounds, 2 assists. Again, playing in one of the best leagues in the world. Six foot nine, 200 pounds. He's got terrific size as basically a two guard. Seven foot five wingspan. He has got very long arms, really solid finisher, and another just absolutely terrific defensive player. The outside shot with him also really isn't there, but he is a freak athlete. He has unbelievable arm length again, unbelievable size at the two. He runs like a small guard, but he's built like a power forward. If he can bulk up a little bit, I think in terms of what he can provide defensively, he'll be unstoppable. If he develops the three-point shot, he will be a fully complete player. Croatian wing LV Mihaljevic is up next. I've abbreviated his name in-game to LV because that's a little bit easier, and LV is also a fire abbreviation for a name. This is an impressive shot creator who had a really good season overseas, and he has put himself into the conversation as being a top five pick. He only shot 33% from deep, but don't get it twisted. The three-point shot is a strength of his, given his ability as a shot creator off the dribble. He's a good playmaker as well, and somebody who really specializes on the perimeter. He's not a great finisher yet, but he's very crafty. My comparison for him is Luka Doncic, but exclusively outside the three-point line. He's similar to Doncic in the sense that he moves slowly and methodically, but he knows how to get himself open. Now, he cannot go to the basket like Luka can. He's not the finisher that Luka is. If he can improve as a finisher, he should be a 20-point-per-game scorer in this league. Khalil Jordan's on the older side. He's a junior at UConn. But he has been so good for the Huskies that he has put himself into the conversation of being a top five pick. 20.3 points per game on 41% shooting from three led UConn to a spot in the national championship where they were unable to three-peat, losing to Kansas. So Jordan was on the roster when UConn won their first two titles. He was a solid role player. This year, he's taken the leap as the number one scoring option, and he has not looked back. This is a three-level scorer. Solid defensive player as well. I think the floor with him is really high, especially on offense. I'm curious to see what the ceiling is. Certainly not to the level of the top four guys ahead of him. But I do think there's a world where Khalil Jordan ends up being an all-star, given how good he is at scoring the basketball, and with the rest of his game being fairly well-rounded. Kalu Oduga, the big man from Stanford, has had an up-and-down season. He started the year off really well, then kind of tailed off as we got into conference play, but he still looks to be a top-10 pick given his size and lateral movement skills. People who are 7'2", 255 pounds, should not move the way he does, and teams see a potential defensive anchor with him as somebody who is an elite rim protector. He's got a ways to go offensively. He averaged around 13 points per game this year, but much of that was being the tallest person on the floor and being crafted easy shots inside. Especially if he can develop a shot outside 15 feet, I feel like he could be a really dominant player. 
Zachariah Rice, the wing from Duke, had a really strong season. 18 points per game this year as a freshman, leading the Blue Devils in scoring. He's an impressive three-level scorer who was a little bit inconsistent in terms of his efficiency, only 43% from the field, 35% from deep, but it's easy to see the shot-making upside with him, even if he wasn't very consistent on a game-by-game -game basis. I really like him defensively. He can guard all five positions, and given that this is an 18-point-per-game scorer who's a terrific defender and a really solid athlete, I'm not really sure why he's projected to go like 7th or 8th. I feel like he should probably be a top 5 prospect. It's hard to pass on somebody with his size, scoring ability, and defensive intangibles. Slovenian wing Philip Leopold had a really solid season, averaging 11.5 points per game, nearly 4 rebounds and 2 assists. What I notice about him first is the freakish athleticism. He can jump out at the gym, he can run with anyone. But he's a terrific defensive player as well. He's got a great motor, hard nose, gritty, and he's not afraid to get in your face. He's an intimidating trash talker. Has some work to do offensively, but I think the shot making upside is there. Efficiency was up and down, 43% from the field, 31% from three. If he develops the shot making though, he'll be a pretty complete player. And the thought of that is quite scary. Geronimo Trinidad going into this season was looked at as a top prospect, but there are some questions with his size. Throughout much of the year, the question's been with his weight. He's only 171 pounds. He's a twig. However, at the Combine, he was measured in at 6'5", and it's been widely reported throughout the season that he's 6'7". So some sources think he's 6'7", some think he's 6'5", and for a guy who primarily plays the 3 and the 4, that's going to make a big difference in his draft stock because I think teams are going to be hesitant to pick a 6'5", 170-foot forward. That should be the size of a point guard, and he certainly does not have the ability to run the floor like a point guard does. Now, I will say he's good at driving to the basket. He's a slithery finisher in the paint, but with some of the questions with his size, I'm really not sure where he ends up, especially if these questions about his height don't get clear. Jeffrey Thomas, the point guard from Tennessee, is must-watch box office television. He has gotten better and better throughout the season. An impressive shot-making guard who, to me, is a slightly worse version of Trey Young. I think the two of them have very similar styles of play. I don't think it's fair to expect Jeffrey Thomas to be as good as Trey Young. But I think the two of them win in a lot of different ways. 6'4", 190 pounds, impressive athlete, three-level scorer. He's going to be a human highlight reel the second he signs an NBA contract, and whoever gets him is going to be getting a really fun player, who I think has the upside to develop into a long-term starting point guard. Ranking Destino, the combo guard from LSU, had a great season, cementing himself as a lottery pick. 14.5 points, 4.5 assists on 38% shooting from three. He's an impressive combo guard who mostly ran the point for LSU, but he's very effective off the ball as well. That's a big deal. Somebody who can play with and without the ball in his hands. He's a really good three-point shooter, really good playmaker, and really good defender. He's got some holes in his game. He's not a great scorer inside the three-point line, but otherwise, he's a smart, instinctive guard who's going to be a really good player for a long time in this league. When I talked about guys whose stocks were all over the place, Dennis Gordon is one of them. One mock draft has him at 21. Another one has him at 6. If I were to guess, I think he's a little bit close to that projection at number six. He's an impressive athlete who had a solid season overseas, nine and a half points, over three and a half assists per game. One of the better playmakers in this class and somebody who has shown the flashes as a scorer, but it's probably going to take him a little bit of time to really adjust to scoring at the NBA level. He doesn't have any major weaknesses to his game. He's a good defender, good athlete. I do think he ends up in the top 10, even if not everybody agrees right now. Let's look at the Kansas backcourt next. We'll start with Shaden Barnabas IV, who was a huge piece in Kansas' championship team, averaging around 12 points per game on 36% shooting from three. Barnabas was able to play as the second or third option for that Kansas team, somebody who's a really good spot-up shooter, can play defense, but when needed, when the star players are out, he can lead the offense. Then we get to Devin Harbour, who's a little bit more polarizing. Coming into the year, Harbour was not a super highly regarded recruit, but he started the year on fire, which is why he's ranked pretty highly in some of these mock drafts. Through his first five games, he had scored 
20 plus points in three of them with great efficiency. However, he really came back down to earth. He had to play a different role for this Kansas team as the year went along, sort of as a glue guy in the Derek White mold. And I feel like he really excelled at that. In the national championship game, for instance, he only scored four points. He went two for two from the field, but he played some great defense and had some really good passing. This is somebody who can score the basketball. He showed the flashes as a great scorer early in the year, but he's also somebody who can be a role player. As a scorer, he's inconsistent. The efficiency was up and down, 44% for the field, 30% from three, averaging around nine a night on the season. But he's a really good athlete, really solid defender, and he's a good passer as well. 3.1 assists, that was the highest on the Kansas roster. Devin Harper, to me, is somebody who impacts winning. I don't know what his role is going to be in the NBA, but I think the kid's a winner. Arkansas wing Carson Young has a lot of similarities to Harbor. This is somebody who can play on the ball and run the show offensively, but can also play off the ball as a 3 and D type of glue guy. I think this is a really intriguing prospect because he has a lot of really impressive aspects to his game. He's an all-around scorer. He can really shoot the three ball well. He's a 6'8 combo guard. He's a good playmaker, has a good feel for the offense, and he's a good defensive player. I thought he had a really solid season for Arkansas, 10.7 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 3 assists on good shooting splits, 47% from the field, 37% from 3. He's got a 7-foot wingspan and can guard the 1 through the 4. I'm surprised more teams aren't interested. I feel like he's kind of the perfect role player who has the upside to become more than that down the line. Michigan State guard Nikolos Papadakis was one of the top projected picks going into the year. A highlight reel shot maker. In high school, he was regarded as the best shot creator in the country, and that has not fully translated at the collegiate level. He averaged 13 points per game, but he did it on 39% from the field. He did shoot 34% from three. The three-point shooting is still really impressive, and teams still like the shot-making flashes, but I think the floor with him is low, especially if he does not learn how to play off the ball. Nitro Rodriguez from Ole Miss. This is someone who had a quiet freshman season, comes back as a sophomore, and really figures things out. Just under 13 points per game, 7.5 rebounds on good efficiency. He's a solid three-level scorer. He's a good enough defensive player. He doesn't have many real strengths to his game, but I feel like he's a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, somebody who doesn't have a glaring weakness either. French combo guard Antoine Celis is a fascinating prospect to me. He is one of the most inconsistent players in this class, but I think the upside is there. Another really impressive shot creator. I think this is somebody who can kind of be in the Jamal Crawford, Lou Williams vein as somebody who's a microwave scorer, off the bench, six man of the year type. Only shot 34% from three this year, but much of that wasn't so much his three-point shooting, but more so his questionable shot selection. I think he's a good playmaker as well and somebody who can play on the ball. Not a very good defensive player right now. He's kind of a traffic cone on that end of the floor. But you're drafting him for his offense and you hope that he can develop into a little bit more. Rafael Torres from USC had a really impressive season. 13 points, 7.5 rebounds. Wasn't really regarded as much of anything coming into the year, but he was really impressive as a scorer. 58% from the field, super efficient, especially inside the paint. And he's got an outside game as well. He can pop and shoot the three, which is impressive for somebody who's 6'11". Now, defensively, he's not particularly good. You would like for him to be a versatile defender in the sense that he can protect the rim and he can guard the perimeter, but he's not particularly good at either of those things. So the question is, is he more of a wing who can defend guards, or will he be better off protecting the rim? He's got to figure that out and really at least get good at one of those. Otherwise, he's going to be a major net negative on the defensive end of the floor throughout his career. Francis Gardner-Jones from Memphis is a professional bucket getter. 15.3 points per game on pretty solid shooting splits, 47% from the field, 35% from three. The consistency wasn't always there, but again, the flashes certainly were as a shot maker, one of the highest scoring freshmen at the collegiate level this season, and somebody who I think has the tools to be a really good scorer at the NBA level. He might be the worst defensive prospect in the draft, though, so he's got to get that figured out. This is somebody who can put 25 on you a night, but he's going to let up 25 himself. 
As we look down the board, we're really starting to look at the guys who are certainly going to be in our range as we pick at number 22 overall, if we choose to stay with the pick. Center Albrecht Schwartz, I think, could be a good fit for us. 10.3 points and 7 rebounds per game. This team obviously needs some rim protection, and I think Schwartz can do that. He isn't the most nimble and fleet of foot, but I do think he's fast enough to where he won't be a liability going up and down the floor, but we're drafting him for what he's going to provide in the paint. I think he's a good enough offensive player inside. He's not really anything special, but he's good enough. Vishnik Blieva from Kansas, another big man. I think he has a little bit more upside than Schwartz does. But I think he's a little bit more raw and has some more work to do. 6.8 points per game and 8 rebounds. He shot 64% from the field, but he really doesn't have any offensive game outside of the restricted area. Now again, we're drafting him for his defense. He's not a great rim protector yet, but the flashes are there. You like the size at 7'1", 240. And he's a really impressive athlete. A pogo stick lob threat and somebody who can really run the floor well. Certainly better than Schwartz does. Again, I think he has more upside than Schwartz, but he has a ways to go. Lazar Badiaga is another player when you draft him, you're hoping for upside. He might be the most raw prospect in the draft, but he might be the most freakishly athletic as well. Overseas, he averaged around 6 points per game, 4 rebounds, 40% from the field, 30% from 3. He's a decent defender, but nothing spectacular. In other words, he's got a long ways to go. I don't think he's going to be in an NBA rotation next year. Could be a draft and stash option, but I think he's got really impressive upside. He's new to the game of basketball, and he's improved quickly. That's the biggest thing. Over the last couple of years, his improvement has been very linear and very fast, and I think teams are going to like that and think if they can get him in their development program, that growth is going to continue. Weston Weaver from Illinois has a really impressive skill set. Had a great season this year as a junior. 14 points and 10 rebounds, shooting 38% from three. There are not a lot of players in the NBA who fit the archetype of elite rim protectors and great three-point shooters. When we inquired with Indiana about getting Miles Turner at the deadline, they were not interested in trading him. And that's because there's pretty much nobody like Miles Turner in the NBA. Weston Weaver is that kind of upside. Obviously, he's still got a ways to go, but whoever drafts him is hoping they can get a similar player to that of a Miles Turner. Going into the year, Laszlo Zonka had some real top 10 hype, and his stock has dropped quite a bit to being a fringe first rounder. Now, on paper, the numbers look pretty good. 15.8 points, 5.4 rebounds, 4.6 assists, but he was expected to be really the best player at the OTE level. And he just wasn't. His offensive game was really inconsistent. For somebody who's as big as him, 6'9", 230, I wish he was stronger going to the basket. I think that's the biggest thing he needs to improve upon. He looks all burly and muscly, but he doesn't play like it. He's inconsistent as a three-point shooter. I do like what he provides as a passer, and I think he's got good size and length defensively, seven-foot wingspan. But I was disappointed by his season. I still like the attributes and physicality that he brings to the table. I still think he belongs in the first round, but certainly a pump for the brakes moment throughout the season. As we look at the very end of the first round, I think Chance Palmero from Kansas is definitely a name to watch here. Palmero was another really good role player for this national championship Kansas team who has their entire starting five in the draft. We've already gone over three of their prospects. The one guy we haven't talked about yet is their final four MVP. But as we look at Palmero, really good catch and shoot guy, really good perimeter defender. He's going to be a good player in the NBA. I'm very confident of it. I don't think the ceiling with him is all that impressively high, but for a team at the end of the first round, who is probably a playoff team and looking for somebody who can get playoff minutes as early as next year, I think Chance Palmero, even though he's only 18 years old and one of the youngest players in the draft, can certainly do that. 12 points a game on 42% shooting from three. Let's look at the second round now. A familiar name here at the top. Of course, Darius Springer is the general manager of the Golden State Warriors. Wouldn't it be kind of funny if he drafted his son? Jabari Springer is not the prospect that his dad was, but there's a lot of similarities to their games. Springer, like his dad, wears number 12 and goes to Duke. Nine points and six rebounds on solid efficiency. He is physical going to the basket. Great at scoring in contact like his dad. I don't think he's quite the athlete that his dad is, and I don't think he sees the floor as a playmaker as well as Pops does. The one thing he does have on him is I think he's a better three-point shooter 
than Darius Springer was entering the NBA. And if you remember, Darius Springer was a 29% three-point shooter as a rookie. He eventually became a really good outside shooter, but it took him a while to really have that as a great aspect of his game. It certainly would be a fun storyline to see Darius Springer draft his son. Behind him, some other names to watch in this range include Bo Washington out of Florida. Had a pretty solid sophomore season this year, averaging around 14 points per game. Very inefficient from three, though. Only 29% from beyond the arc. The outside shot, certainly something that needs to improve. But I think he's a good scorer from inside the arc. He's a very old-school type of player. He can hit the mid-range, solid defensively, isn't the flashiest, but he really gets the job done. And if he can be a more consistent three-point shooter, I think he's going to be a good role player. I like Nelson Evans, small school guy, Sacramento State. KJ Jeffries, another name to watch. Five-star recruit coming into the season who was a little bit disappointing throughout the year. 11 points, 7 assists. He did average 2.6 assists. I like the playmaking upside with him. But kind of similar to Laszlo Zonka. He's built very strong physically, and he just doesn't really know how to use his strength. Going to the basket, only 44% from the field. Not a great outside shot either, 29% from three. While we're on the subject of Sons of Blazer Legends, Zay Logan's son, Zymir Logan, is probably a better prospect than his dad was. The UNC point guard stands at six foot eight. He's built like a wing, but he runs the point. 12.5 points, nearly five rebounds, and three and a half assists on 40% shooting from three. He's a pretty good defensive player as well. I have no clue why he's projected in the second round. Everything I said, when you look at his size, when you look at his shooting ability, that screams first rounder to me. And if he does fall to the second round, some team's going to get a steal. Another guy I like in this range is Cameron Tylik from UCLA. High volume, low efficiency scorer. As a freshman, he averaged 16 points a game this year. So putting the ball in the basket comes pretty naturally to him. He shot the ball a lot, though. Sometimes he has tunnel vision on offense, and he had some really bad shooting nights. But he's also somebody who can heat up on a dime, and when he's on a heat check, he's really hard to stop. He generally needs the ball in his hands. He doesn't have a lot of value offensively without it. That is kind of a concern. He's also not a great defensive player, so that's the reason why he's projected in the second round despite the high points-per-game average. Leo Mitchell from Kansas. His stock has gone up drastically this year. Final Four MVP, national championship. He scores 21 points, goes 7 of 8 from 3. But he's 23 years old. What does the ceiling look like for him other than being a spot-up shooter? I don't really know. He was obviously great at Kansas, but what is he going to be other than a catch-and-shoot guy in the NBA? And obviously those are valuable, but... You're not drafting a 23-year-old solely three-point shooter in the first round. I do think he certainly could be worth this second-round pick. And then as we look way down the board, trying to find some gems projected in the 40s and 50s, there's a name down here who I think has the potential to be a star at the next level. From Overtime Elite, Nate Great is a six foot five point guard. Very crafty, driving to the basket. Really impressive athlete. Had a great season this year, basically coming out of nowhere. 22 points per game, nearly 6 assists, 5 rebounds. Now, he's got some weaknesses. He cannot shoot the ball. 21% from 3. Really cannot score efficiently outside of the paint. But, he's a great finisher. I like what he provides defensively as well. And if you look at his athleticism, there's no reason to think he can't improve. It's easier said than done, developing the outside shot. But, if he does... He'll be a first-round talent. That's really the only thing that's missing in his game. So there's your draft class. Really fun group of guys. I do want to take a look at the combine and then talk about these mock drafts as well to see where everybody is projected going into draft night. So we'll start with the combine, and we'll look at some notable performers. Vishnik Blieva, the center from Kansas, tested unbelievably well. Really impressive with his numbers, and it's easy to see the athleticism with him on film. We talked about his upside athletically. He ended up stealing the show at the Combine. Francis Gardner-Jones from Memphis, the score first wing. Another guy who I was really impressed by here at the Combine. He looked like a guard running out there at nearly six foot nine. Zachariah Rice, the projected top 10 pick from Duke. Another big winner in my opinion. And another box being checked as to why he probably should go in the top five. Rafael Torres from USC. His stock has gone up all year. 
keeps the momentum rolling at the combine. He was really impressive. Carson Young from Arkansas was really good. Nelson Evans, Sacramento State, 6'6", 235. He's built like Derrick Henry, but he's the fastest player in the entire draft. And in the early second round, he could be a name to watch out for. Averaged around 21 points per game for the Hornets. Obviously didn't play the best of competition, but another guy to watch out for likely in the 30s. Jeffrey Thomas performed well. No major surprise given the season he had at the University of Tennessee. And now we've got to figure out who we are going to invite for pre-draft workouts. Knowing we have the 22nd pick, there's certainly a large number of guys who could slip to us. We could look at the opportunity of moving up as well, and we could also look at the opportunity of moving out. If there's a really good veteran available for our pick, given that our championship window with Curry and Butler is closing, that might be something we want to consider. But we also want young talent, and there are a lot of really good young players in this draft, so if we get the chance to trade up, we might have to. The players we're going to bring into the facility are French point guard Dennis Gordon. I didn't invite Barnabas. I don't think there's any chance he falls outside of, like, the top 13. We are going to invite Devin Harbour, Carson Young, Antoine Celis, Rafael Torres, Francis Gardner-Jones, Vishnik Blieva, Lazar Badiaga, Laszlo Zonka, Chance Palermo, and... What, are we not going to bring general manager Darius Springer's son into the facility? I mean, come on. This is a league run on nepotism, okay? What else were we going to do? So, looking at some notable performers, Carson Young from Arkansas was a guy who really impressed me. 3.5 sprint time, 40-inch vertical, really shot the ball well. None of that's surprising with him, but he is one of the most impressive athletes in the class. Rafael Torres had a great combine, backed it up at the pro day. Devin Harbour from Kansas, I thought he was really impressive. Again, one of the more polarizing prospects in the draft, but a multiple prospect who can play a lot of different roles for you, and he looked good in his pre-draft workouts, in my opinion. Vishnik Blieva tested really well again. His movement skills at 7'1 are pretty unfair. The best shooter in our pre-draft workout was certainly Antoine Celis. Not a major surprise. He's got one of the purest shot forms in this class. Again, my comp for him, a Lou Will, Jamal Crawford type. And I thought Jabari Springer looked pretty good for technically being a Nepo child. That brings us to the mock drafts. What did the Jazz do at number one? They have a tough choice between Miko Kaponen and Bardo Campolo. I don't think you can go wrong either way. And then the question for Boston at number two is, do you keep the pick? I think an interesting avenue is that they move down to four with Washington. Washington could use one of those franchise players. Boston goes down to four. They still have the top pick, and they add another first rounder or two from the Wizards to use his trade bait. This mock draft has us picking Albrecht Schwartz from Michigan. As I said, I think he could be a pretty good fit. I think that pick makes quite a bit of sense. Seven foot, 250 pounds, good rim protector. 2K is the Jazz picking Bardo Campolo, number one, with the Celtics picking Miko Kaponen. So as you can tell, there's clearly no consensus number one pick in this draft. And it could be a game-time decision for Utah, if you will. I'm a little bit surprised that Khalil Jordan from UConn is bouncing around these mock drafts. I feel like he should be a clear, like, top 7 or 8 pick. This one has us getting Rankin Destino from LSU. I would be shocked if he fell to us. I didn't even have him in for a pre-draft workout, I don't think. Because I don't think he's going to fall. But if he does, that'd be a great pick. NBA.com is the Jazz picking Capona number one, Campolo number two. The Blazers have picked three different players at number three. I think it's going to be Martin Sifa, but they've also had them picking the Croatian kid, Michel Jevic, along with Kalu Oduga from Stanford. This mock draft has us picking Weston Weaver, the center from Illinois. As I said, we're looking for a Miles Turner. Miles Turner is a free agent this offseason, but it's not like we're made of unlimited cap space. So maybe getting the Walmart version might not be a bad idea. And that will wrap up this episode. Next time around will be the NBA draft. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I'm changing the date for this year's draft to Thursday. Of course, it'll be a premiere live here on YouTube. I'd love to see you guys make it out and interact with everybody during the draft in the YouTube chat. Should be a lot of fun. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are new. I hope everybody enjoyed. I don't know why I said those things out of order today, but I guess we're going to roll with it. Peace out.